the roads are really slick and icy, we're going to have to get those trucks to slow down and be safe. What about the graders? Well, the graders are uh, <coughs> up. And... Good morning. Oh, good morning. Good to see you again, Joe. Thanks, Mike. This is Jim. He's our safety and loss control officer. Nice to meet you, Joe. Uh, before you start work here, there's a few things you'll need to learn. Uh, we've got to have you complete our training and loss control program, and then we'll have you take a tour of the refinery. Uh, Jim will give you this tour. Welcome aboard, Joe. You ready to roll? Yes, sir. Let's do it. The best way for you to learn the ropes and get a feel for the health hazards here in the refinery is to uh, let me walk you through the steps of the process. I'll alert you as we go to the hazards and controls that a new employee may not be aware of initially. Thanks, Jim. I'm aware of a few of the health and safety hazards in mining, but I'm sure I don't have the whole picture. Well, let me give you an idea. Mercury vapor is a major concern. You see, mercury vapor rises at room temperature, has no warning properties. You can't smell it, you can't see the vapor, but if you see mercury beating, that should alert you that there is mercury vapor in the air. Well, mercury vapor must be pretty dangerous because my Uncle Fred used to work in a refinery, but he had to quit because he got the shakes. The doctor said it was because of mercury exposure. That's because overexposures, especially those we call chronic overexposures, affect the brain and nervous system. That's why mercury is called a neurotoxin, but it also affects the kidneys, the liver, and the skin. Other symptoms of overexposure are fever, there's uh, weight loss, skin irritation, and GI disorder. Any of these nonspecific symptoms should sound a warning bell, but sometimes a miner might overlook them and think, well, you know, I've just got the flu. Now, silver is another common health hazard. Silver fume and dust can cause irritation of the respiratory tract. Silver gets into the mucous membranes, skin, and eyes, causing irritation. By controlling the amount of silver dust in the air, we also control other contaminants, such as thallium and arsenic. Cyanide exposure is also a concern, since we often handle pregnant solution containing cyanide, caustic material, and dissolved metal. The hazards of these chemicals are explained in our material safety data sheets. Now, these sheets, known as MSDSs, are readily accessible to all employees. You'll also get training in each of the chemical hazards as part of your PASCOM orientation tomorrow. You know, Joe, one of the measures we have in place to limit your exposure to chemical hazards is the protective clothing and equipment you were issued, such as boots, disposable gloves, coveralls, hard hats, hearing protection, safety glasses, and respirators. Yeah, I know about respirators. I was fit tested for my respirator yesterday. In fact, it's in my locker right now. Joe? Personal protective equipment, PPE, is the worker's last line of defense against workplace hazards. Engineering and administrative controls are the preferred choices. Uh, for example, the refinery is a highly restricted area. That's an administrative control. The security process we just went through is also the start of our contamination control program. Joe, a big problem in refineries is cross-contamination. Now, that occurs when someone takes contamination from a dirty area to a clean area. For example, if your coveralls have mercury on them and you go into a lunchroom, you've just contaminated a clean area. In an ideal hygiene facility, you have proper security. To enter a clean locker room where you change from your street clothes to your work clothes. Use the restroom and get clean PPE. At this point, you are ready to enter the refinery. We call the dirty side. Within the refinery, various aspects of the refining process occur, and metal dust and vapors may be present. At the end of your work shift or lunch, you should dispose of your contaminated work clothes. Use the laundry and restroom facilities if necessary, then shower to remove contaminants and continue to a locker area for clean clothes. At this point, you can have lunch, go home for the day, or re-enter the refinery if necessary. It's a one-way path. Jim, I get it now. It's like a one-way street for contamination. It can come in, but it can't go back out. Hey, great, you have got it, Joe. You see, the company and I are concerned about you and your family. We don't want you being exposed to hazards here, and we don't want you to take any contamination home. That's why we separate your street clothes from your work clothes. 
now that you mention it, I do remember finding mercury beads in my uncle's pant cuffs and pockets. We used to play with them as kids. Well, that doesn't happen around here anymore thanks to the hygiene controls we have in place. Well, the mercury levels are really low today, so we won't need our respirators. You ready to take the tour? You bet. Let's go. Wow, this is a great view of the refinery. Remember, Joe, beware the power of the dirty sign. Gosh, it seems like it would be really easy to accidentally contaminate the clean areas around here. What do you do if there's a spill? Skywalker, listen to me and you shall not fail. It's important to protect yourself and your fellow miners by following the company's spill cleanup procedures. Well, Jim, it seems like if mercury was spilled on the floor, it'd be really difficult to get it cleaned up. Maybe what we ought to do is just take a squeegee and push it down the drain. <laughs> nice try, Joe. Actually, drains and sumps are serious sources of exposures. When mercury enters a drain, even though it's out of sight, the drain becomes what we call a point source of mercury vapor. You see, mercury continues to vaporize underwater at normal temperatures because it doesn't freeze above 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And another problem with mercury is that it's seven times heavier than water. So it's easily caught in drain traps and tends to stay there unless it's cleaned out by hand. That cleaning further exposes a miner to mercury vapor and liquid mercury. We want you to avoid handling hazardous material. Okay, Jim, I understand I'm supposed to avoid handling hazardous material, but what am I supposed to do if I see a spill or mercury going down a floor drain? Joe, the key to successful mercury control hazards is containment. Think containment. For spills, you can use our mercury vacuum cleaner to pick up the hazardous material. The mercury vacuum is different than your vacuum at home, largely because of the sophisticated filtration system and the container lining designed to prevent mercury absorption. The filtration system is designed to strip mercury vapors out of the exhaust air before it re-enters the refinery area. It's very important that you follow the instructions when maintaining this machine. For example, many machines require removing the filter and storing it separately after each use. If the filter is not replaced according to the manufacturer's recommendations, mercury vapors could be exhausted back into the refinery to expose you and your fellow miners. And if mercury is left on surfaces? Ah, that's where I use the mercury complexer that binds with the mercury to suppress mercury vapor, right? Hey, you're right, Joe. And remember, there's no substitute for common sense, but we do rely heavily on proper training as well. You're going to be trained over the next few weeks in how to determine the most effective cleanup method for a given situation. Well, at this point, you're aware that a mercury hazard exists and how we prevent exposure to that hazard. Yeah, I do, Jim. Containment, containment, containment. <laughs> right on, Joe. Look, a major engineering control we use here is ventilation. If our ventilation system is compromised or neglected, we're in danger of being exposed to high levels of mercury vapor. That's why it's essential that local exhaust devices are properly positioned and filters checked regularly. Duct work and connection hoses must be free of leaks. If the ventilation system is down for repair or maintenance or any other reason, the affected operations must be notified and stopped until ventilation can be restored. An important example of local ventilation is the exhaust hood over the refining furnace, sometimes called the crucible. The high heat in the crucible drives off residual mercury vapors and generates silver fume that is considered hazardous. As you can see, we've installed a large canopy over and around the crucible to channel the heated air into an overhead mounted filtration system before it exits the building. Temperature affects mercury vapor generation. Lower temperature reduces the release of mercury vapor. Filter presses and retorts, as well as the electro-winning cathodes used in other refineries, should be cooled before they're pulled. Now this is important. The cooler the temperature, the less mercury vapor. In contrast, high temperature and cooking time are extremely important for driving off mercury. The length of cooking time in the retort depends on the amount of mercury present in the ore, the temperature, and the size of the pan being used. Recognize those pipes coming from the retort? I think that's the pipe that goes to the condensers right back there. Now if I understand it correctly, the mercury vapor comes from the retort, goes into the condensers, where it's condensed into the collection pots. Then the gas continues on through the scrubbers before it's released to the outside air. Is that right? Exactly. You see, these scrubbers are our second line of defense 
before we release any air into the general environment, we want to make sure that all mercury vapor is contained. Finally, just plain old housekeeping is also a critical part of our control program. We want to keep our refinery as free of dust and dirt as possible. That's why you'll be trained to perform regular washdowns of floors and keep the walkways free of trash and debris. We'll also ensure that all equipment is free of dusts and deposits that may provide a collection point for mercury. Gosh, Jim, I'm beginning to feel like there's mercury everywhere. How do I know if I'm being exposed or not on the job? I like how you're thinking, Joe. One of the ways is through regular monitoring. The most important kind of monitoring to you is called personal sampling, using a passive dosimeter. This device samples the air you breathe, but without a pump. We also do area monitoring with a direct reading instrument called a mercury vapor analyzer that provides real-time results. The sniffer, as we usually call it, is easy to carry into the worksite and gives us a reading of mercury anywhere we use it. Our standard procedure is to sample for mercury vapors before the shift begins, immediately after the break, and in the event of emergencies or spills. Another type of monitoring is medical surveillance, which involves testing blood and urine samples to determine if the hazardous chemical is present in an employee's body and, and at what level. But that doesn't mean your responsibility ends here. You see, we can make you aware of the exposure hazards here in the refinery, but it's up to you to consistently wear the appropriate PPE and to follow the health and safety guidelines that we've developed for you and your fellow employees. Whoa, 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 Jim. Are you telling me that I'm going to have to learn a whole bunch of health and safety guidelines in addition to my real job? You do want to work here, don't you? Yeah. Look, health and safety never takes a back seat to production. Practicing healthy work habits is just as much a part of your job as pouring molten metal out of a furnace. You're one of our most valuable assets. We don't want to lose you to some workplace accident or occupational illness. Besides, you're going to find that working in a safe and healthy manner, look, is not as difficult as you might think. It just requires learning to follow some simple procedures like uh, paying attention to signs. Speaking of signs, Jim, I noticed you got a whole bunch posted all over the place here. What are all these for, anyway? Well, Joe, most of the signs are self-explanatory. We want you to think of them as reminders of things you've been taught in your training classes. Also, we want the signs to help the visitors inside the refinery to uh, make them aware of any hazards that they might be approaching in here inside the plant. Looks like you guys have thought of everything. Seems like a guy could kind of relax with all the training that he gets and all the signs that you have posted around. Well, it may seem that way, but, but sometimes things happen that are out of the norm. A, a fire, explosion, power failure, these things may require you to shut everything down safely as soon as possible. There's a lot more to this job than I realized at first. But I like the fact that there are people like you, Jim, that are concerned about my health and safety on this job. Well, thanks, Joe. Well, now you've seen the refinery and how we work safely here, the last step to completing a safe work day is to leave all work contaminants at work. Now, here's where we take the route from the contaminated to the clean, leaving behind everything that might have any mercury or other hazardous materials on it. Remember, be familiar with and know how to protect yourself from the hazards that you encounter in the refinery. Properly inspect, maintain, and use appropriate personal protective equipment, PPE. Follow standard operating procedures including spill cleanup procedures. Monitor and maintain ventilation systems. Conduct regular monitoring. Understand and follow warning signs. Practice good housekeeping. Know what to do in an emergency.